Hello everyone, it's finally time for me to put out a video discussing the Victoria 3 war system in detail. Looking at it from different angles, looking at the reasons for it existing, looking at how it came about, we're going to cover it all. I've been meaning to do this for ages of course, and I'm doing it now because the release of Victoria 3 is right around the corner. I'm one of those few Paradox content creators who doesn't have any deals with Paradox. I'm completely independent and I give my honest thoughts and opinions on anything based on my own perspectives where I come from in terms of these games. The only obligations I have is to my subscribers, the viewers, all of you people, and I owe you the truth. So if that sounds like a good idea to you, and you're not yet subscribed, then you should subscribe. So this video is about Victoria 3's controversial war system. You might be wondering, why are you doing this? It won't even change anything. Victoria 3's war system is what it is. Well this video isn't really designed to make Paradox change their mind or anything, I just want to document the whole thing. Even though I'm not getting the Victoria 3 I specifically wanted, I'm still covering this game on my channel because it's the sequel to the main game of my channel. Also there really is nobody else out there saying what I'm saying on any big platform, any channel, covering Victoria 3 from this perspective. So I feel a sort of duty to get this point of view out there and explain it nicely and logically with evidence. In a watchable length video format instead of on a stream, or just talking about it with people on my Discord, or in a multiplayer voice chat for Vic2, I want to get it out there publicly for everyone to watch. Also, I've made a lot of memes against Victoria 3 and I've been generally disparaging towards it in various comments on streams and whatnot, and now I'm going to back all that up with this video. One of the main things I'm going to do is try and find if there was a consensus before the announcement of Victoria 3 as to what people wanted it to be. Micromanagement has been removed, and a lot of people are trying to gaslight us into thinking everyone always wanted that. That idea is dead after this video. So what better place to start than Victoria 2? Well, Victoria 1, but frankly, I don't know anything about that game. This is something unfamiliar to us now, but it's called a box and it used to have a thing called a disc in it, but what I'm really showing this for is the fact that it says conquer through blood in giant letters right on the back there. When you pick this box up in the shop to see what this game's all about, it seems that war is at least one part of it. And of course the main artwork shows Bismarck leading Prussian troops into battle. Quite misleading for an economic, political and diplomatic simulator. Victoria 2 has a war system where you have stacks of units that you can move around on provinces, and if you go into the same province as a stack of an enemy that you're at war with, you will engage in a battle. Then you have technology, dice rolls, unit compositions, different unit types, who is the attacker or the defender and which terrain you're fighting in, loads of different things that contribute to how that battle will resolve. There's a lot of different approaches to this in the way you compose your army, the way you move it about, strategies, tactics, everything. There are lots of ways and scenarios in which you can win a war despite having less troops than the enemy. The AI doesn't handle armies in Victoria 2 very well, but if you're up against players, that's where the fun really begins. The system I described is generally how every other Paradox game does it as well. Micromanaging units on a map. But then we fast forward 11 years and they announce the sequel to Victoria Victoria 2, Victoria 3, and then a few more months after that they announce what the war system in this game is going to be, and it's a complete radical departure from what I just described in Vicky 2. You no longer control any units or stacks that move around on a map, it is all now in an automated system. A front line will develop between you and the country you're at war with, and AI controlled generals will make all the decisions for you and move around troops that you can't really see anywhere, they don't even have models on the map. Victoria 3 also offers many different changes in other fields such as the economy, politics, diplomacy, but this video is really all about the war system. Before I make any points about the Victoria 3 war system, I will always be referring back to their main reason for making this decision and implementing the system they have. This is what Martin said on the very first dev diary about the war system and it's the first time he gave the reason for it. This is it. Victoria 3 is a game primarily focused on economy, diplomacy and politics, and that's what they would rather you be doing instead of micromanaging wars, basically. They want to reduce the amount of time you spend micromanaging wars so you can use that time on the economy, diplo and politics. That's what I understood from this paragraph when the first dev diary came out and I read that, and it's been confirmed by other things they've said since. So I'm going to start by challenging that, the very reasoning for this entire Victoria 3 war system. In Victoria 2 when a war breaks out, that pretty much takes up all your time from that point. You will be micromanaging it and using your units. And in Victoria 3 when a war breaks out, their intention is for you to not suddenly stop managing your entire country and your economy to focus on that. But in my opinion, in Victoria 2 this isn't so bad. When you choose to go to war in Victoria 2, you should have set up your economy and politics to a stable state that can manage on its own for a little while. And of course, in single player, you can just pause the game when a pop-up comes up or something. If the intention in Victoria 3 is for you to pause the game less, because there's less need for it because the game is more balanced in terms of your focus, then how come the developers of the game itself kept pausing it throughout their streams of the game? And I don't just mean them pausing to stop and explain things to the audience, I mean they really just did pause the game a lot as any player would to do certain things and read events. They were also witnessed at many points not pausing the game and just instantly clicking away an event without reading it. Anyway, when a war breaks out in Victoria 2, the game goes into a different phase, your focus completely changes, you're doing something different. It breaks up the game. In Victoria 3 the intention is at least to have your focus be the same throughout the game, always managing your economy, diplo and politics, even during wars. 
I don't think I've seen anyone from Paradox itself make this argument, but a lot of people who support the Vic 3 war system say that the 19th century was the most peaceful time in human history. Therefore, it's right that the game focuses on things other than war in this time period. Well, should I even have to come up with things to dispute that? Instead of showing a big list of all the wars that happened in this time period, even if we just do the 19th century and don't go past into the 20th century where we have World War One, let's actually just go back to the Victoria 2 box for this one. We've got the Prussian army there just being all peaceful and tending to its economy against an American army. Of course, speaking of the USA, the first DLC that came out for Victoria 2, A House Divided, centred around the American Civil War. Not only does this remind us of that extremely important, brutal conflict, in Victoria 2 this DLC came out with a start date so that you could fight that war. I'm pointing this out because a lot of people even say that Victoria 2 was meant to be the economy, politics and diplo simulator that Victoria 3 now is becoming. So before I go on to put forward my proposal for what I would have preferred for the Victoria 3 war system, even among people who are generally in favour of what Paradox has done, there are a lot of suggestions for more ways to improve it and add a few more things. For example, I see a lot of people suggesting ways to at least give your generals rough directions and objectives on where to go. Maybe you can give your generals a province that is an objective that they're going to push for. As it is, they're scripted to go for war goals and the capital city of the enemy. I see people asking for ways to split the front lines into more front lines so you have a bit more control. The problem with all these suggestions is. The more Paradox adds to the war system, the more control they give you, the more ways you can interact with your generals, tell them what to do, give your armies more ideas of where to go, the more micromanagement they're actually adding. And the whole point of this is to not have any micromanagement. And as you can see with this answer on the Fronts and Generals dev diary, they're considering giving you more control, but they don't want to give you too much control, because that would go against the whole point of what they're doing, which is less control. So if you support this war system, you better be happy with what you currently have. Adding more options and player agency goes against the whole principle of the war system. Now if we had a compromise system where you could micromanage or automate your troops, these ideas for giving objectives to your AI would really add to the automation aspect of it. In any case, when they do expand on the war system in DLC, it will be along the lines we just talked about there in terms of giving objectives. That's where they will add stuff. And it is when, not if, they will add DLC for the war. There's a lot of things in Victoria 3 I cannot predict or I cannot be sure about. I don't know how successful the game's going to be, for example. But my crystal ball does tell me that they will add DLC or updates for the war system. So, my perspective of this game comes from the Victoria 2 multiplayer community. We play a campaign, 4 hour sessions each week, and in it we have a lot of wars where we fight each other, and we make deals, we backstab each other, we have diplomacy, and we also have a lot of salt, toxicity and rage quits, and just all the problems that come with any online or gaming community, I suppose. But Victoria 2 multiplayer is so good because it combines lots of different things. You get your element of nation building and watching green numbers go up, of course, and you get an amazing environment for diplomacy. But the wars are what make that diplomacy and that nation building matter so much. It's what makes the stakes so high. The wars are based largely on skill, but everything could come crashing down based on luck as well, making it really exciting. And the thing that all this is leading to is the Great War, the huge epic conflict. Battles all over the world, different fronts, lasting for years in game time and sometimes multiple sessions of Victoria 2, 4 hours each. It's like Hearts of Iron 4, but the Great War is completely different every time and can have different countries on different sides. And unlike Hoi 4, if you lose the Great War, you can build yourself back up, do some diplomacy and win the next one. This idea of a peaceful world of industrial innovation and progress throughout the 19th century that Victoria 3 is trying to create, in all its really happy artwork and imagery of industrial progress all the time, and how it translates into the philosophy of the game of making war a low priority, well in real life that world came crashing down in the fields of World War 1. The industrialised production of goods became the industrialised killing of men. All Paradox had to do was make the end date for Victoria 3 1913, but no it goes all the way to 1936, the dawn of the next fucking war. Victoria 2 multiplayer matches build up to the Great War just like real life did. Victoria 3 matches just build up for the sake of seeing your green numbers go up. Anyway, back to the game. Since we fight wars against other players and not the AI, we actually learn how to fight wars well and outwit and outmatch other players. When you fight wars against the AI, you're learning how to beat the AI and the AI sucks. Over all these years that the sweaty Victoria 2 multiplayer has been going, we've been constantly exploiting the game, looking for any little way to get an advantage over the other players. And of course, writing extensive rule sets to get rid of all the exploits that are inherent in an old game like this. So 
we've actually learned the game inside out. We know all the bugs, we know all the problems. We know the game way more in depth than any person who just does single player ever could. My body of work of Victoria 2 multiplayer videos shows all that. I strongly believe, despite our numerical inferiority in the overall player base of Victoria 2, that we should really be listened to about Victoria 2 and a potential sequel. Although in terms of hours played, we might be up there. Multiplayer obviously gives way more replayability to the game than single player. Personally, I got bored of single player after a few years of Victoria 2, but multiplayer I'm still doing now and I'm still finding it thrilling and enjoyable every time. Well, most times. And we keep returning to multiplayer lobbies despite how unstable they are and the constant crashes and going out of sync and having to re-host all the time. It's got to be something if it keeps us coming back through that. Unfortunately, the fact is that we were not listened to at all. If Paradox even knew we existed, they didn't really acknowledge or listen to us about this. What's my evidence for that claim? Well, the infamous people skills comment, of course. This is from a Q&A on the Victoria 3 Discord. I'm just using a transcript so I don't know exactly who answered this. The reason that this comment was pretty terrible was not because we were being told to use people skills and the haha we have less people skills we don't go outside and all that. That's funny but it's not the real reason. The real reason is because it implies that we didn't use people skills or a real ability to negotiate in Victoria 2. Of course we already did loads of complex negotiations and all that in Victoria 2 multiplayer. Then when the diplomacy set the two sides of a war they fought it out. The Diplo always carried a threat of war in Victoria 2. I suppose Diplo will carry a threat of war in Victoria 3. Just a different kind of threat in that you don't really want to fight a war because the war's shit so threatening to fight it makes everyone really unhappy. But the absolute worst thing about this comment is that he wants us to use negotiations and people skills despite not providing an in-game multiplayer chat in Victoria 3. The game doesn't provide you any way of using people skills or a real ability to negotiate. You have to use a third party software to negotiate. And of course we already do, we use Discord, we used to use TeamSpeak, but in the Victoria 2 multiplayer community the in-game chat is still extremely important. People use it for actual negotiations, you can message individual countries. It's obviously much easier to use an in-game chat than it is to tab out and message someone on Discord, even in a new game that has better borderless settings. And we have specific rules where you have to type out that you're declaring a war or something. And informing the entire lobby when we're re-hosting, when something's happening, the host can keep the players updated. It's just a really basic thing for multiplayer, we shouldn't even have to give reasons as to why it should be in the game. It was so bad that I didn't even get downvoted horribly for asking it on Reddit and I was scrutinising the developers by asking this. They're using the same multiplayer infrastructure as CK3, so CK3 players, you can let us know how that's gone for you. I've played it a few times in multiplayer with mixed results in terms of stability, hot joining really didn't work at all. Maybe they fixed it. And of course CK3 doesn't have an in-game chat either. I'm not sure how the CK3 multiplayer community such as it is feels about that. I wouldn't be happy. Imperator Rome doesn't have an in-game chat either. So this is now the norm for Paradox. This is their standard release. No in-game multiplayer chats. Well, you might say, Spudgun, you didn't suggest anything to Paradox throughout this whole time. You didn't make any recommendations directly to them or in any forum they might read, at least before the announcement of Vic 3. Well, maybe that's true. They might not have heard about what the Vic 2 multiplayer community generally wanted from Spudgun, but they heard about it from this guy. Gaku is an old classic Victoria 2 multiplayer player. He goes way back and he's even got a lot of great multiplayer videos that inspired me in many ways. If you watch them, you might even find some familiar faces in them. Anyway, the reason I brought this up is to show that someone from the Vic 2 multiplayer community made a really in-depth huge video about this subject. 1 hour 44 minutes, and that's why I haven't watched it. But 77,000 people have, so it's no small tiny fringe video from a little tiny community. He says a lot of things about every aspect of the game, but I'm going to focus on the war stuff of course. So just listen to this. Division Designer, as inspired by Toy 4. If you have ever watched me play Multiplayer Victoria 2, and I'm playing a relatively large nation, you've probably seen me spend well over half my time just organizing units and this is not fun or interesting you know taking units splitting them off it's never uh, it's never an even split so you have to split off exactly the right number move them to the right place and then reorganize once your units get where they're going you have to get rid of the extra ones oh look a hussar i need one of those let's move him up this sort of thing is not interesting this shit's got to go we're going to use the division designer from hoi Ford. a system like this will make unit management way easier in victoria 3. So instead of having to track down and manually organize your individual brigades, so you just have all your battalions in predefined formations, then you just build them by the type of division that you want. Line management, as inspired by Toy 4. As we progress through the Victoria timeline, we get further and further into the age of trench warfare. And what this means in a practical sense as far as line management is concerned, is that we've got more land to cover, we've got more brigades to deal with, and we've got more divisions to micromanage. But the general idea is that you should be able to assign fronts and then assign units to it. 
And this is especially true for your rank and file defensive units. There's no reason that you should be forced to micromanage every single division that you have in the world. Now the extent to which it should be automated, that's debatable. But at least for lines, just standard lines with defensive troops, there's absolutely no reason that shouldn't be automated to some degree. Now he has many other suggestions, I obviously didn't do the video justice by just taking a couple of them, you can watch the whole thing if you want to, but the point is that he clearly identifies the problems with Vic 2's war system. The multiplayer community obviously isn't blind to them. The two examples I showed you from the video are particularly him fixing known problems with Vic 2's system. In other parts of the video he goes on to suggest innovations that would improve it even more in different ways. But Paradox has made their choice and rather than talking about amazing new innovations, we're talking about even managing a war at all. That's how low they've set the bar. Some people might be surprised to hear suggestions like Gaku's coming from the Vic2 multiplayer community. Some people see us as complete purists who want every aspect of Vic2 to keep going, even the tedious elements. Well there are some people like that, but I've come to realise, along with many other people, that in order to make a viable sequel that'll do well, you need to get rid of the tedious, completely pointless aspects of the micro and leave the good stuff, the actual fighting. This is called a compromise, and it's not radical, it's a basic idea. Introduce some automation, quality of life improvements such as templates. I would actually use eu Force template designer as another example. Other examples of good ideas from EU4 would be some missions that you can automate your troops to go on, and that would also definitely apply to navies. Definitely some blockade automation. And remember, Victoria 2 already has the setup for this sort of thing, the rebel hunt feature. You click this button, your army becomes AI controlled to search for rebels and kill them. And if you have a puppet and go to war, you can command the troops of your puppet. So Victoria 2, as it already is, has systems in place to change armies from AI to controlled and controlled to AI. Stuff is already halfway there. You can easily see how that could have been expanded on instead of starting completely from scratch like Vic 3 actually has. Also big shout out to the purely cosmetic battle plan designer, doesn't really do anything but it hinted at what could have been. So, recognising that the Victoria 2 multiplayer community is a minority of the player base of this game, I would argue an extremely important one that should never be overlooked, but numerically smaller, sure, let's get an idea of what the more single player oriented people wanted by looking at what the big suggestions for Victoria 3 were some time ago in the Paradox Reddit. I tried having a look for similar things in Paradox's own forums, but it's not that easy to find stuff, and any threads I do find might just be one individual's opinion, not necessarily shared by that many people. As much as I hate Reddit, I can see what was popular because of all the upvotes so a lot of people share the opinion, meaning I can get a really good sample of what people thought. We can't say for sure that this one thread I'm about to show you is the definitive absolute will of the players at that time, but it is actually evidence, and I'm basing this on evidence. From their own place, no less. Evidence? No! So, in this thread from Paradox Plaza, three years ago, long before Victoria 3 was announced, let alone learning what they were doing with the war system, what do the people ask for? Well, in this post, 974 upvotes, a very popular post, talks a lot about various mechanics, economy and so on, but here's the one about combat. Hold on a minute, didn't I just talk about this? Cutting down on the tedious aspects of micromanagement by adding templates and front lines to help you with massive amounts of troops. This individual is not asking for micromanagement to be removed. We're going to be finding a common pattern throughout here by the way. So if we scroll down, what else do people say? Usual stuff. Someone here asking for a more detailed diplomacy system. Well, they've certainly attempted that with diplomatic plays. Expanded science and technology, I don't think it really has been expanded to be honest. Deeper internal politics, that certainly has been improved and added, yes. Here's the next big war suggestion that you can find in this thread. Quality of life improvements, like template designer from Hoi 4. Fascinating suggestion. The compromise, the ideal thing for Victoria 3 would have been to add quality of life templates. Is he asking for micromanagement to be removed? No. And by the way, this is back at a time when most people didn't really think there would be a Victoria 3. So people were just honest and open with their suggestions. They aren't biased by the current arguments about Victoria 3. So I think this is a really good idea of what the community wanted. Here's a suspiciously deleted post where they go on to discuss mana. That's the old mana debate which is really irrelevant for Victoria 3. I mean, three years ago, this is around the time of Imperator Rome, so that was a huge discussion back then. The closest we came to discussing that sort of thing regarding Victoria 3 was a capacity system. Ultimately, I came to the conclusion that they are nothing to do with what people sometimes call mana. Instead of being a blind hater, I always give credit where it's due. They learned their lessons from Imperator and they made this different system. They didn't use mana at all, so no problem, really. I personally came up with another joke word that was dismissive of this mechanic. As opposed to mana, I call capacities electricity, because you have a generation and a usage. Oh, I need to form an alliance with that country, but I don't have enough diplomatic electricity to supply it. I'll have to annex them instead. But I haven't heard anyone else call it electricity. It hasn't really caught on at all, so I'm just speaking shite. 
54 upvotes for a carbon copy of Victoria 2. That would get 54 million downvotes nowadays. But there really was a consensus for this. Not quite literally that, but just something very similar to Victoria 2 that sort of made nice improvements, fixed a lot of things, nothing too radically different. But since Victoria 2 Paradox went on and did very different things, they came out with EU4, they came out with Hoi4, they came out with Stellaris, and 50 million different DLCs in between. And the Paradox community grew and changed a lot over this time. So as time went by and the community grew, people looked back on Victoria 2 as a weird old relic of the past. A strange old game that did things very differently. Victoria 2's actual own players didn't really go anywhere, we just became outnumbered by the new players from everything else. Vicky 2's last DLC was released in 2013 and since then, well I've got two sources to show what happened to the Victoria franchise since then. Johan Anderson confirmed in a tweet when they actually started originally working on a Victoria 3 project. Late 2014, just over a year after they released that final DLC for Vicky 2. So they were originally working on Victoria 3 as a sequel in a reasonable amount of time after Victoria 2 had come out, just like every other franchise. And I think it's safe to assume that this is the sequel that we were actually looking for, it was just a nice iteration and improvement on Vic 2, with a new engine so it would run better, better optimization. Of course we have the DLC concerns right there that he's being open and honest about, but we're still going to get the DLCs for the modern Victoria 3 anyway, so this is still better. Why this didn't happen or where it all went wrong is something I'm not too sure about. Anyway, the next bit of evidence as to what happened to the original Victoria 3 projects. This is their current lead designer saying he joined the project in January 2017 and entered full production in early 2019. So I'm starting to get a rough picture of the timeline of Victoria 3's development here. In late 2014, about a year after Victoria 2's last DLC, Johan started working on the actual sequel to Victoria 2, but at some point that project was abandoned. That's the key part I'd like to know a lot more about, so I should ask them sometime. It seems like the game went through some wilderness years where they were just tinkering with it, putting it to a new engine and coming up with different ideas, then in 2018-19 the current lot took over and put in their vision with this war system included. By 2020 the game was definitely in full production so Paradox made a phone call to Susan asking her to boost a Victoria 2 channel and the algorithms for them, but that backfired because I turned out to not really like the direction of Victoria 3. Anyway I keep getting sidetracked, we were talking about that thread. People in this thread and in general talk a lot about how Victoria should model the changes in technology and the type of warfare you get, from the early 1800s where you get Napoleonic style warfare to increasing front lines and then up to war. World War 1. Gaku makes his own suggestions in his video for this and he even uses Vicky 1 as an example. But to a certain extent, this is in Victoria 2 in the game mechanics, but the thing is that AI cannot do it. As the number of units increase later into the game they don't suddenly change to frontline behaviour, they always act as if it's the early game. But in multiplayer human players will change their behaviour to go along with the technological changes, the machine guns, the combat width. In multiplayer if you go around with a death stack in the late game you're just gonna get encircled. And in the early game if you spread your units out on a frontline, the enemy will concentrate a big attack on one part of your line and you won't be able to reinforce it in time and you'll lose. Doom stacking works better in the early game, which is realistic. So it really is just an AI issue. And I've heard a lot of people say that Paradox are copping out of improving their AI, as far as war is concerned, by just removing it. You don't have to work on making a good AI decide where to put its troops if it doesn't have any troops. So the next post in this thread that I found about war, this time the post actually begins by criticising the micromanagement in Victoria 2. But how does this person suggest fixing their problem with Victoria 2? The same way we've already talked about, the Hoi 4 system, the templates, the quality of life, improvements, not removing micromanagement, no one asked for that. It's like Paradox took this post here and only read the first sentence and thought, oh yes, they hate the micromanagement so we'll remove it. They didn't listen to anyone's suggestions on how to improve the micromanagement. They decided that they knew better than players of the game. So this post talks about a priority of things that this person wants in Victoria 3. The priority of things to be worked on, I suppose. The focus of the game is the economy, diplomacy and politics, and war isn't that important to the game. And this is actually more or less the exact priority that went into the actual development of Victoria 3. They told this right from the announcement of the game. However, if we think back to some time before Victoria 3 is being developed, if we say let's leave war as the lowest priority to change, does that imply the system we actually ended up with in Victoria 3? Or does it maybe imply leaving it the same as Victoria 2 and not actually changing it that much? Putting all the development resources into the economy, diplomacy and politics. Because that's what the non-multiplayer community wanted, that was the will of the players. All of their priorities and all the things they're asking for in that thread are to do with economy, trade, politics, that sort of stuff. Well, leaving war as a low priority in the development of Victoria 3 is absolutely not what actually happened. The devs themselves say this. It wasn't just a little side thing that they worked on while focusing on economy, diplomacy and politics. They actively worked on this war system a lot. It was challenging. The lead developer of Victoria 3 explains.
he calls making the war system a long, hard road. And he is definitely correct in saying that this was surprising for me. One of the likely implications of this message is that they originally intended to not work on the war system that much, but it ended up being more complex and challenging than they thought so they had to spend more time on it. One of the first things that came into my head when reading this was, imagine one of the things you put most of your development resources into just being to remove a system. You didn't add anything, you just removed war. They sunk a great deal of time and effort and found it extremely challenging to give us an extremely simplified automated system that allows us to focus on the other things in the game. War is extremely costly in the game, so you're going to be dissuaded from doing it and you're going to do it a lot less than you would in Vic 2. And when you do actually have a war, you're not going to be microing it, you're not going to be looking at it that much, you're just going to let it happen. They went down a long hard road to create a system that the game actively dissuades you from using. It's actually insane. There just seems to be a bit of desynchronization between the amount of time and effort put into a system and the amount of time the player will actually use it or do anything with it. The other main takeaway from this post is that he's excited to expand on it in the future. When you've read a lot of material from Paradox Developers, developers over the past couple of years as I have, you learn to read between the lines and figure out when they're hinting at DLC, and that's it right there. And it really makes me think, this doesn't just apply to the war system, but this applies to any paradox game and any paradox system. If you're already thinking about expanding it, does that mean you're not happy with how it currently is? Isn't it good enough to stand on its own two feet right now? after you've spent so much time developing it. A few years after a Paradox game comes out, after enough updates and DLC, it becomes completely unrecognisable to when it started. And assuming Victoria 3 doesn't flop as much as Imperator Rome, this will be no exception. If you like the current Victoria 3 war system, well, enjoy it while it lasts. Paradox games just don't seem to be developed to stand on their own two feet at launch. When they release a game, they're only releasing just one little iteration of it that's going to change ridiculously over time. And that's a business model, it's the way they do things, but I think it's dishonest, because they do all the marketing marketing, they want you to pre-order it, they want you to have it on release, and the devs keep telling you how proud they are of the work they've done and how good the systems currently are, even though you're getting an unfinished product. Then you have to pay scandalous amounts of money for all the DLC they release to actually improve the game. Realistically though, I think there should be a fine balance between being proud of the game you've actually released and changing it later. A company that never updates a game would get criticised heavily as well. Paradox lean way too far in the changing it later direction. So that's all I'm doing from that Reddit thread. If anyone actually has evidence of people asking for the removal of micromanagement from the Victoria franchise before One Proud Bavarian's video or before the announcement of Victoria 3, be my guest, share it with me. Now to sum up my thoughts on the direction that they've taken the war system in Victoria 3, it was so blindingly obvious, just take the Victoria 2 system and make some good changes. Add the templates, add some automation, add some front lines to help people micro, while leaving a solid basis of skill and micromanagement for the multiplayer community to enjoy. Hearts of Iron 4 is an extremely successful game. One of the reasons is it has the best of both worlds. More casual players and first time players can just set up a front line and hit attack. No complicated micro, but as you learn the game you can start to introduce micro and when you become a really good sweaty try hard player you're microing every unit the casual single player community are happy and the sweaty multiplayer community are happy imagine at least trying to please all the communities who play your game and not completely alienating one of them now i know hoi 4 is a war game and victoria 3 isn't that's why i call this a compromise we the players who enjoy the micromanagement of wars in victoria 2 because we play it against other players instead of the inept ai would get what we want which is the ability to micromanage every unit you have and the people who don't want to micromanage get to use front lines with a button to attack and a button to defend they get to let a war automate so they can do their priorities in the game, which are to tend to their economy or their politics. A good compromise like this would avoid dividing your community and making it toxic and hateful to each other. And the benefit for the developers themselves? Well, since you're not going to be creating an experimental radical new system that requires starting completely from scratch, leading to a long hard road full of challenges, you get to put more time and resources into the economy, politics and stuff, which were your own priorities and the priorities of a large part of the community. One critique you might have of this is, well Spudgun, it's a bit late for you to suggest this, but as I showed earlier, with Gaku's video and the Reddit thread, two very important pieces of evidence from different aspects of the Victoria 2 community, this was suggested years ago. It was what the community wanted and absolutely nobody asked for the removal of micromanagement. My official challenge to everyone is to find one person asking for the removal of micromanagement before the development of Victoria 3 was announced. Pro tip, you won't find anyone and you'll find people asking for what I'm asking for. The first person that I've noticed to call for this or suggest this was one Proud Bavarian's video, where he outlined the so-called 
crackpot theory, the new radical theory of what the Victoria 3 war system could be. In the video it seems like he's speculating, but some people have put forward a conspiracy theory that it was just testing the water and gauging the community's reaction to the real system that was actually coming. Not too insane a theory when you realise that one part Bavarian got dev diaries early, and he was clearly getting them early before he publicly said he was getting them early. I mean, just look at what people were saying on the thread where they first revealed this new war system. Loads of people refer to One Proud Bavarian's crackpot theory. People who had watched that video are clearly less surprised and shocked at what happened. Whether or not it's a good change, it was a radical change and it's a big surprise. The blow was clearly softened by One Proud Bavarian, which sort of helps the transition to the new war system. Whether it was a natural occurrence or planned, it's an act of PR genius, and it's really necessary to do some PR when you're departing so far from the sort of game and the mechanics that you grew your company on and what your fans came to expect. I'm not saying that game developers and whatnot can't try new things and experiment and go in different directions. Before trying that you should probably check the consensus of your current player base to see what they actually want for a sequel. If there's already a clear, blindingly obvious path as to what the next game should be, then going in a radical new direction really requires a lot of good reasons and justification, and it better be damn good. And not an unfinished mess that doesn't even achieve the goals that you yourself set for it. And realise that going in a new direction will alienate many of your loyal players, and it could easily lead to toxic arguments and all that stuff. The amount of vitriol and hatred shown towards people who don't like this new war system is absolutely insane. I would say a majority of the people arguing back against what I've said misrepresent me, they just lie, they just insult me. It's what I've seen in comments to my own videos and streams, the Paradox forums and the Victoria 3 Reddit in particular. One of them was a vaguely implied death threat. When you criticise the Victoria 3 war system, these are some good examples of what you get. Most of it is just objectively wrong. I can't predict the future, but when you look at all these messages, I can't help but think that the community is in some kind of mass hysteria. People are just utterly deluded and at some point in the future even these people will look back and wonder what the fuck they were thinking. And that's one of the reasons I want to show this. The people defending the Vic 3 war system have already won. They have the system they want. Yet do the tones of the messages shown here strike you as people who are confident that they've won the argument and got what they wanted? People say just don't play it, the game's not for you, even though this game is a sequel to one that we loved, and for me specifically made all these videos about, did all these streams. So even though they've already got a war system they supposedly want, that's not good enough, they also want to stamp out anyone that criticises it. That has really motivated me to keep going with all this, talking about this war system. I put these examples on the screen because if I didn't do that, people would probably just deny that they were saying all these objectively wrong things constantly. But the absolute best thing about all these people is that they would turn on Paradox in the blink of an eye if Paradox did something they didn't like. We saw it with Imperator Rome and we see it with every DLC that doesn't go down well. And if Victoria 3 doesn't go down well, which I cannot predict at this point, well that could get ugly as well. Frankly, I'm really enjoying this whole Victoria 3 thing. Every time we've covered the Vic 3 developers streaming the game, it's been absolutely hilarious from start to finish. Just non-stop banter. Having fun and being right is a really good combo. But now that I get to experience being in a small minority being overshadowed by people who want something different getting what they want, I now know how my Mountain Blade Warband viewers feel. Now, unlike Paradox, I recognise that those guys exist, I love them, and I really miss the old days when I made those Mountain Blade videos. They were good times. And Tell Worlds is a good company, Bannerlord a good sequel to Warband. They didn't get rid of combat and war in their game. Paradox has really set a low bar for what a good sequel is, I suppose. I'll be streaming Victoria 3 on release day, so I hope to see all of you in that stream. It's going to be a pretty fun time. And however Victoria 3 goes, whatever happens with that, there's so many great plans for content on this channel, particularly in Victoria 2, but also other things. And there's also loads of non-Paradox games to check out that I've been recommended. Don't get too disheartened by all this everyone, I'm always here for you. Taking on the minions of a massive corporation isn't easy, here's my Patreon link, you know the drill, and join the channel membership and that sort of thing. Also join my Discord. People who have opposing views to me are welcome on my Discord. We don't have a downvote system and I don't ban people unless they break the rules. Arguing against my views on Victoria 3 isn't against the rules, you can do it freely here, just keep it in the right channels if need be. With all that said, goodbye everyone, I'll see you soon. Thanks very much for watching.